my name is Grace, and together with the band, we welcome to you, welcome you to this uh, Sunday morning service at the Beaches Baptist. And to all the fathers in the house, or not in the house, or fathers to be, happy Father's Day to you all today. Can you believe it? We are halfway through the year, and we just thank God for that. And we pray that the Lord will see us through the rest of the year and many years to come. Um, I'd like to read a scripture to you from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for gifting us a new day, another opportunity to worship you and enjoy all that you've provided for us. Lord, forgive us for the poor choices and habits that we struggle with as we worship you in song and hear your word that, bring, that Phil will bring to us today. Build our faith, release us from every affliction be it sickness, depression, loneliness. And do that, Lord, we pray, by the power of your Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Mm. Amen. Amen. So we're going to sing our first song, How Good It Is to Be Loved by You. Isn't it great? As you sing it, sing it to yourself. To be loved by 
Bill's on his way to bring the notices. And then we'll have communion straight after. Good morning. Sorry about that. I realised when I got here that I didn't pick up my microphone in order for you to be able to hear me. But it's great to see you all. Uh, Those of you who are here in the building, those joining us online, you're really welcome to this service this morning. Uh, Just a few things uh, by way of notices, or just one thing really, and that is to let those of you who are church members know that tomorrow is the last day where we can uh, nominate deacons for the upcoming deacons election. Um, So if you haven't yet, I'd encourage you Please have a think and a pray about who uh, might be right person uh, to nominate. If possible, it would be great if you could have a chat with that person, first of all, just to, to encourage them to say, hey, I think you'd be great in that role. Um, if you want to know more about it, then please do speak to Janet. She can explain the whole process to you. But tomorrow is the last day to get those nominations in, please. So we uh, have opportunity this morning to share bread and wine together. And as we come to the Lord's table, let's pray. Lord Jesus, once in another time and place, you sat at a table with friends, offering them both comfort and challenge. Today, in this time and place, we too gather round a table wanting to be close to you, to tell stories, to share laughter and to hear your voice. Meet with us, we pray, just as you did with them, that we may know the comfort, the challenge, and the joy of your company. Source of hope, whose word began and sustains all life, we confess that there have been times when we have not lived as those who have heard the voice of God. Shaper of hope, in whose living and loving God's intention was realized, we confess that there have been times when we have not lived as those who know the love of God. Inspirer of hope, whose challenge and call are insistent and strong, we we confess that there have been times when we have not lived as those who have felt the touch of God. Trying God, we offer ourselves again to you. Inspire, enlarge and energise us that now and always our lives may serve as a sign of yours. Generous God, whose story and song are now and always the hope of the world, we praise you for the stories of creation and incarnation, redemption and resolution, of unending words of love. We rejoice in your song of yearning and calling, waiting and welcoming, gathering and cherishing the eternal music of hope. We join our voices now in that great song of love and adoration that creation sings back to you. We thank you for this bread and wine, which are signs to us of your unfailing love. So as we eat and drink now, please bless us with your presence, strength and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this is the table of the Lord on which he sets his tokens of love and hope and to which he calls all who want to share his life. So come. Whether your faith is strong or weak, whether your hope shines brightly or is dimmed, come ready to receive, for all are welcome at this feast of love. Paul writes those famous words in 1 Corinthians, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it
And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I invite you to take the bread that you have and to eat it. In the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So I invite you to take your wine or juice and let's drink together. And we continue in prayer. Father God, we remember who it is that we come to as we pray. You are a great and mighty God, creator and sustainer of all life. God who is above all and in all. God who has saved us, forgiven us, set us free to new life through the death and resurrection of Jesus our Saviour. Lord, today we pray for those that we know who are uh, celebrating Father's Day. For some, Lord, this is a day of celebration and joy and much love. For others, it's a day of many difficulties, varied, whether fathers are here or not, or children are here or not. Whether uh, our experience of fatherhood has been positive or negative. Lord, we come to you, our loving Heavenly Father. And we express our love to you and give you thanks. And Lord, we want to pray too for various folk in our own church community who uh, need your love at this time. I want to pray for Nikki Cloudsdale. Lord, we thank you that she's home again now, that there's, uh, the infection that she had has um, cleared up from what it was. Lord, we pray that that would go completely, that the pain that she's still experiencing at times would just leave her entirely. Uh, we pray especially for tomorrow, uh, for the scans that Nikki will have, which will reveal uh, what's happening with her cancer, whether it's reducing or not, whether the treatment is working or not. Lord, we pray for good news from that scan. We pray that her body will have reacted very well to, uh, to the treatment that she's been having. And as the treatment is ongoing, we pray for Nikki, for strength for her, protection for her body, Lord, we pray for Mike and Victoria uh, um, that you would give them all the strength and the help that they need. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, just uh, protect that family, hold them close to you. May they know your presence with them in all the ways that they need. Help them, Father God, we ask. And Lord, we want to pray too for uh, Clifford's story. Uh, thank you again that he's back at home after a little time in hospital following a fall. Lord, we pray for Clifford. You know exactly what's going on in his body and mind, God. We pray for Margaret, his wife, as she cares for him. May they know your strength and help in all the ways that they need. 
May Clifford especially know your presence with him. Thank you for his faithful service of you for so many years. And Lord, we uh, pray for Doris Sawyer as well, uh, following a fall that she had. Again, Lord, we pray for healing for her. We pray for uh, her to, to be know that you are with her and close to her. Thank you for her love for you and for her church family. And we pray for your blessing upon her. And Lord, we lift Janet Hale to you. Um, pray particularly for her following the uh, death of her brother, who she loved so dearly and uh, who she hadn't seen for a long time because of everything going on. Lord, we pray for Janet. She would know your comfort in her bereavement, in her grieving. And we pray for the rest of her family and those who knew her brother and loved him and will miss him. May they know your comfort. And Lord, as we pray for Janet, Lord, we also pray for um, others of us who are grieving, uh, whether a recent loss or one uh, longer ago. Lord, would you help us as your church family, as brothers and sisters, to be able to love one another well through the harder times as well as in the celebration? Help us to grieve with those who grieve and mourn with those who mourn. Lord, as we uh, continue shortly in uh, sung worship and as we turn to your word, we ask, just have your way with this time together. Speak to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're continuing uh, this morning our series uh, called um, Who Are We? A series based on some of the basics of the Christian faith, based on some of the alpha material. And today we're thinking about the fact that we're called to be different people, different to those around us. And uh, there's a poem that I'd like to read now before we sing again, written by Gerard Kelly. It's called One. Even though we are all different, we are one. Though the skins that are stretched over us have shades enough to mark a path from coal to snow in micron increments, we are one. Though the fine lines of our features are free hand enough that even smiles are signatures of difference, we are one. Though the polarities that plague us can have power enough to make sparks fly, every time we come together, we are one. Though the stories that have shaped us are self-penned enough to fill a library with the secrets we each hide, and though the route maps we rely on may be rough enough to make finding common ground a roller coaster ride, though the distinctives that define us may be deep enough to aggravate and irritate and painfully divide, and though the languages we vocalise are localised enough to keep a truckload of translators tongue-tied, we are one. Many, but one. Different, but one. Awkward, but one. Reluctant, but one. Taught to be one, bar none. May our maker make us one. Let's worship again.
open up your hearts. Open up your hearts to him. Come to him with all that you have. Come to him with all that you are. And just lay it there before him. For he is God. And he will provide all that you need. All that you need. He is God.
Amen. Thank you, Grace. So as I mentioned, we're continuing this, stories, uh, this series called Who Are We? And this week we're thinking about being different people, people who are uh, called to be uh, distinctive, it's called to be different to the world around us, set apart for God. D.H. Lawrence said this, he said, if only we could have two lives, the first one in which to make our mistakes and the second one in which to profit by them. But there are no dress rehearsals for life, are there? You're on stage straight away. And we all make many mistakes, but the question is, how can we make the most of the rest of our lives? The good news is that God loves you. And God has a great purpose for you for the rest of your life. And Paul describes how we can make the most of the rest of our lives in these words found in Romans 12. Romans 1 to 11 is all about everything that God has done for us in Christ. And then in Romans 12, he starts and he says this. Therefore, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. So in view of everything that he's written in verses 1 to 11. And there's a lot of amazing things in Romans 1 to 11. In view of everything that God has done for us. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing and perfect will. So we're called to be different. Paul says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Or as J.B. Phillips translates it, do not let the world around you squeeze you into its mould. And the world there is the world which is hostile to God. And this is the challenge, he's saying. There's a huge pressure for us to conform. I heard about a young police officer who was doing his final exams at Hendon Police College. And the first three questions he got through pretty easily, but then the fourth question went like this. You're on, a, you're on patrol in outer London when an explosion occurs in a gas main in a nearby street. On investigation you find a large hole has been blown in the footpath and there's an overturned van lying nearby. Inside the van there's a strong smell of alcohol. Both occupants, a man and a woman, are injured. You recognise the woman as the wife of your divisional inspector who is away at present in the United States. A passing motorist stops to offer you assistance. You realise he's a man who's wanted for armed robberies. Suddenly, another man runs out of a nearby house shouting that his wife is expecting a baby and the shock of the explosion has made the baby's birth imminent. Another man is crying for help having been blown into an adjacent canal by the explosion and he cannot swim. Bearing in mind the provisions of the Mental Health Act describe in a few words what actions you would take. The officer thought for a moment, picked up his pen and wrote, I would take off my uniform and mingle with the crowd. <laughs> and that's the temptation, isn't it? That we take off our Christian uniform, if you like, and mingle with the crowd. Just do what everyone else is doing. So much easier. But we're called to remain distinctive. We could say, perhaps, that we're called to be a chrysalis rather than a chameleon. Chrysalis is a pupa that turns into a beautiful butterfly. A chameleon is a long-tailed lizard that changes colour according to the background that it's on. And that's the temptation, isn't it? To be a Christian in a Christian environment. But as soon as we're not in a Christian environment, to move into that environment, to be like everyone else around us. And that creates tension in our lives. Because we're one thing in one environment and another in another environment. We're called to be different, but we're not called to be odd. You know, we're not called to wear odd clothes or to speak in an odd language. Or, In fact, we're called to be authentic. Jesus was the most authentic person who ever lived. He was the most fully integrated human being, the best human being. Oscar Wilde famously said, didn't he, be yourself, everyone else is taken. So Paul says, break with the past and make a new start. Be transformed. Let God transform you inwardly 
by a complete change, as one translation puts it. And the point is this. God is not going to ask you to leave behind stuff that is good. God loves you and he wants the very best for you, for your whole life. And he only asks you to leave behind the rubbish in your life. I was speaking to someone earlier this week and they said to me something which I thought was actually really sad when I paused to think about it. He said, the only, thing, the only things that are fun are the things that are bad for you. And he was kind of, just sort of thinking about uh, drinking lots of alcohol and uh, smoking and gambling and even a few drugs. And I just thought, that's such a sad outlook on life, isn't it? If I think the only things which I can enjoy are things that I know are no good for me. But there is so much fun in this life, isn't there? So much good in this life that God has for us. Things that he wants us to enjoy. In fact, Jesus said that he'd come to give life. And life in all its fullness. And unless we leave behind the rubbish... We can't enjoy that fullness of life, the good that God has for us. God has so many treasures for us. And in Romans 12, Paul sets out some of those treasures. First of all, sincere love. And the word he actually uses there is anupokritus or something like that. Anupokritus. Should we say it together? Anupokritus after three. One, two, three. Anupokritus. Well done. You've got it. Excellent. I couldn't say it, but you can. And it means unhypocritical, apparently. And a eupocritus was the mask that they used to put on when they were when Greek people were in a play. And in life, we can put on masks, can't we? If we're not comfortable with who we are, we can pretend to be someone else. Someone we're not. But the trouble with that is no one ever sees us, do they? They just see the mask. God loves you so much. So much. Just as you are. I mean, you, who you really are, God loves you. So you can drop the mask. It occurred to me earlier as I heard the words that Grace uh, read at the beginning of the service where, where uh, Paul writes saying that we are God's masterpiece. Now, if, if we put on masks, it's like we're saying to God, you haven't quite done a good enough job, God. I think I can improve on it. Well, look around at creation. Can you improve on that? I can't. God has made you, you. And he wants you to be you. He loves you. So we can drop the masks. And when we start dropping our masks, that's when real connection happens. Sometimes perhaps we can think that we'll impress people by our strengths. Look at how good I am at this or how strong I am in that way or this way. But actually we often connect with people through our vulnerabilities, through being real with one another. When people drop the masks, that's when real connections happen. And in the context of our church life, I think small groups are a great way to develop those kind of mask-dropped relationships, if, if you like. So again, I'll just say, if you're able to, to connect with a small group, please do that. If you want to know more about that, speak to me or Andy, who's our small group coordinator, Andy Blackburn. Sincere love. And then Paul goes on to say another treasure is enthusiasm with uh, with our, in our relationship with God. He writes, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Romans 12, 11. In other words, don't just have a one-off experience with God. Don't just think, I've got my ticket because of that one experience. This is meant to last for a whole lifetime, isn't it? God longs for a relationship with us for our entire lives. What matters is the long term. Where are we going to be in our relationship with God in 10 years' time? not just our initial experience. Our relationship with God is meant to be growing and growing and growing, getting better and better and better and deeper and deeper and deeper. So Paul writes, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Don't just copy the world around you. Don't just go with the flow. Be different. 
And Jesus, Jesus taught us how to do this by loving even our enemies, by loving everyone, loving God, loving our neighbour, and even our enemies. And Paul expounds on that teaching. He says, don't take revenge. Bless those who curse you. Love your enemies. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. And to be a Christian, therefore, is so radical, isn't it? This is not what the world around us teaches, is it? Mostly. Being a Christian is not just, oh, I'm going to be a little bit nicer. I'm going to be a slightly better person. That's not what it is to be a Christian. It's transformational. It's about radical love. Love for God, love for other people, love even for our enemies. And this changes everything. This is so beautiful. And the world needs more of this, doesn't it? Turns out God actually knows what he's talking about. How much do we need people to be willing to count the cost and to go that far, to love those even who persecute them? The treasures which God has for us in store when we are, are only possible to grasp hold of when we leave behind the rubbish. So how do we do it? Paul writes to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Present your bodies, that's everything you have, your time. Time is the most valuable possession. Do you know that? You can always make more money or get more money. We can't make more time. It's easy to get our priorities wrong, though, isn't it? Often what happens is when people put their trust in Jesus, they become Christians. They, they change their priorities. Different things become more important than they were before. But it's easy to get our priorities wrong. I read about a farmer from Kenya who was looking for a wife. So he put this advert in the East African Standard. This was a genuine advert. It said, Nanyuki farmer seeks lady with tractor. With view to companionship and possible marriage, please send picture of tractor. <laughs> it's easy to get our priorities wrong, isn't it? But when you experience God's love and relationship with God, your priorities change. And people become, people become the most important thing. Relationships become the most important thing. And first of all, first and foremost, our relationship with God. And I would encourage you, just make an, a new commitment today. Spend a bit of time each day with God. Pray, speak to him, communicate with him. All relationships are based on commun communication. And get into his word, read your Bible, think on it. Even if it's just a verse a day, just read a verse and think. What does that tell me about God and what does that mean for my life and the, and the world around me? And then you need other people. We can't do this on our own. So make coming to church or being part of a church community uh, and a, a priority as well. It's not that long, is it, to come and join with other people once a week or even twice a week. Remember the days when people used to connect with church twice a week? And small groups, as I was saying, and prayer triplets and, and relationships with other Christians who really mean something, not to the expense of all other relationships because we must have other people who don't know Jesus so that we can witness to them and share God's love with them. But it's important that we encourage one another and build one another up and help one another. We can't do it on our own. And then Ambitions. Give God our ambitions. Say, where I go with my life is up to you, God. Yeah, I have hopes and dreams, but I trust you enough that you love me enough that you've planted those hopes and dreams in me that if they're in accordance with your will, they'll come true if I follow you. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. It's so easy to go searching for meaning and purpose and joy and love and acceptance in all kinds of different things. What Jesus is saying is, seek first God. Put God first. And what you'll find is the joy and the hope and the love and the acceptance and the meaning and purpose in your life is found first and foremost in God. You'll get that thing that you're searching for, those things that you're looking for and all the other stuff. And often he'll give you a whole bunch of other stuff as well. Our ears, what do we listen to? Do we just listen to rubbish or to gossip or something? Or do we listen to things that build us up and encourage us? Our eyes. We can use our eyes to look at all this stuff in lust and jealousy. Or we can use them to look at people and say, that's a person who God loves. That's a person who Jesus died for. How can I bring God's love to that person? And our mouths. 
James says that the tongue is so powerful, it's so small, but it's so powerful. And with this little thing, we can curse someone, we can wreck someone's day, you can actually wreck someone's life through the things that you say. Thinking about Father's Day today, fathers, bless your children. Speak life and love and blessing to your children. So we can decide to use our tongues to bless people. With just a, a few words, we can change someone's day. Isn't that incredible? When was the last time that someone said something really lovely to you? Think about how it made you feel. Let's seek to do that for one another in our hands. Do we use them to take or to serve? To cause harm or to create good? So Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And the extraordinary paradox is this, that we can think that if we give everything to God, if we present everything that we are and all that we have to God, it's, and say, I'm only going to go your way, God, it's like we lose our freedom. But actually what happens is the opposite, isn't it? We find the more that we do that, the more free we are. St. Augustine said, uh, God's service, his service is perfect freedom. And I, I would say I found that to be true in my life. The more I live my life the way I know God wants me to, the more I serve him and put him first, the more freedom I find and feel and experience in my life. Paul writes, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And that sacrifice tells us that there's going to be a cost sometimes. Jesus didn't come to make your life easy. Sorry if you were expecting that, but that's not why Jesus came. He came to make you great. And that means that there'll be lots of challenges. There's a challenge of getting rid of the rubbish. It's only rubbish, but at that time we can feel like we, might, we can't let go of that thing can have a real grip over us. It can be really hard sometimes. We might not want to get rid of it. But the only way we can pick up the treasures is if we let go of the rubbish. And then there's a the challenge of also being willing to fly his flag in what can seem like a hostile environment. I heard of a, a wealthy English baron called Baron Fitzgerald. And this man, he, he only had one son and, and his son tragically died when he was away from home and he died very young and so the baron was completely devastated he didn't know what to do with the rest of his life and he found that uh, he got some joy from art so he threw himself into investing in great works of art uh, paintings by the old masters and he went around the whole world collecting all these paintings and then when he died his will called for there to be an auction and at this auction again there were people from all over the world because these paintings were magnificent and worth so much money um, but he'd laid down in his will some very careful instructions about how this auction should take place. He said that the first painting to be sold should be a painting that he had done of his son when he was still alive. And it was before he'd got interested in art, he wasn't a very good artist, so the painting was a bit naff really. But he'd stipulated that must be the first painting at the auction. And because it was a bit naff, only one person bid for that painting. It was someone who, was, who had worked for the family and knew the son and loved the son. And he bid for it and he got it uh, for a very small sum. And then the second clause in the will said this, whoever buys my son gets everything. The auction is over. And that's what Paul is saying here. Whoever chooses, God says to us, whoever chooses my son gets everything. Gets the whole lot. God was prepared to give his only son for us because he loves us. Will he not also give us everything on top of that? Paul says that he wants you to present your body as a living sacrifice so that you can prove what God's will is for your life. God's will for your life is good. It might not be easy, there may be cost, but God's will for your life is good because he loves you. And it's perfect. You can't do better than God. You have great things ahead of you in your life. If you go God's way, God loves you. He's poured his love into you, into your heart by the Holy Spirit. He's given you a bubbling love for other people around you. Let that love out in the way God wants you to. Even love for your enemy.
It's what the Holy Spirit does. And so if you're struggling to love someone, pray for them and ask God to help you. Pray for God to give you his heart for that person. And that can be tough. Because sometimes people do atrocious things and really hurt us. But God can help us to love even our enemies. And you can make a difference with your life. You're a child of God, filled with the Holy Spirit. So be different to make a difference in God's name. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the things that we've been thinking about. And uh, my prayer now is uh, just, Lord, the things which are of you, would they really stick with us? Thank you for your incredible love for us, God. Fully expressed through Jesus and his death and resurrection. Thank you for the life that you've given us through faith in him. Thank you that we can drop down the rubbish things, God, and pick up the treasures that you have for us. Thank you that you only have good things for our lives. God, give us the strength that we need to drop the rubbish. Give us the strength that we need to be ourselves without wearing masks. Give us the strength that we need to love people, to to be uh, your people, to live life as you want us to, to be those masterpieces that you've created us to be, that more people may realise who you are and worship you too. God, we say we are yours. Have your way with us now. We offer ourselves to you as living sacrifices. All that we are, all that we have, we're yours. Have your way with us. Thank you that you can take and use ordinary people like us to do extraordinary things. Help us to be different, that we may make a difference in your name. We pray in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. for bringing it and we've heard that we are a masterpiece that we're different to make a difference keep telling ourselves that all the time I will certainly be reminding myself and um, 1 Peter 2 9 says but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were not a people but are now the people of God, who, have not, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Isn't that wonderful? I hope you feel inspired and encouraged. Um, we're going to sing our last song um, for today where we... We tell the Lord we will offer up our life. Please stand with me. up 
gates of heaven and have beckoned me in. Jesus, what can I give? What can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving a king? Savior, what can be said? What can be sung as a praise of your name for the things you have done? Oh, my words could not tell, not even in part of the debt of the Lord. Let's, let's pray together. Mm. Our Lord God, Adonai, may the entrance of your word bring light to our eyes, to our hearts, and to every tough situation mm. that we find ourselves in. That we may see Jesus with hope renewed Fueled by our, your love, O oh Lord, order our steps into your truth, into every good work. Mm. To love those that don't sound or look like us. To love those who persecuted us. To forgive ourselves and love ourselves because you first loved us. Help us to remember that we are your masterpiece. That we are your work of art. Even when we don't feel like it. Even when we have a wobble. Where we suffer from imposter syndrome. Help us to remember who we are in Christ. And the authority that he gives us. Thank you for your unfailing love now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Have a fruitful, blessed week. I hope the sun comes back. <laughs> God bless you all.